Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. We haven't had him, we haven't had him on for a while, but he's had a lot of success, and I want our listeners to understand uh, the ability of an entrepreneur to create value in the marketplace, and we're going to hear about his story building his business, and we're going to hear his thoughts on the gold and silver market and on te- the technology market because he's an ETF entrepreneur, Andrew Chanin who's founder and CEO of Pure Funds. Thank you for joining me again. Thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me, Jason. Great. Uh, I'm glad to have you back. A- Andrew, you've had a lot of success the last couple of years since you started your firm in 2010. It wasn't always an easy going, but for our listener, before we start talking about your company's story, what is an exchange traded fund? Yeah, you know, I think it's a great, um, you know, a, g- a great conversation topic to, to get into before getting into this broader um, interview about, you know, kind of my experience. Um, you know, right out of school, I happened to be placed into a group that focused on the floor of the American Stock Exchange on trading exchange traded funds. And I remember even studying uh, majoring in finance at university. There uh, was, I remember in our textbook, there was either one or two paragraphs on on exchange traded funds in the entire you know equity book that was supposed to teach you you know everything you need to know to to get an intro into the industry, um, and you know I, I found out that very few people knew what ETFs are and that's still the case which is unfortunate because these have become this revolutionary um, type of product that can give investors exposure to you know numerous. Uh, types of investments, asset classes, strategies, and themes. And you know, on the you know, from from a high level, kind of a lot of people will say an ETF is like a mutual fund. It's like a modern day mutual fund. And essentially, what they mean is, like a mutual fund, by investing in a share of an ETF, you can get exposure to uh, a, a broad, diversified basket of companies or fixed income products or even commodities and currencies. And we're seeing um, exchange traded funds as being a way for investors to get relatively uh, low cost, instant diversification into these either uh, themes or strategies that investors are looking to invest in. Um, you know, and kind of what we've done is we've taken that even further and saying, instead of investing in you know, broad types of um, equity investments like um, you know the S and P 500 or uh, you know global stocks. We're even carving it up even more and saying you know let's create investments for people that want to invest in very specific industries, like you mentioned, silver exploration and other areas within technology that we'll get into later on this on this uh, interview. Yeah, when I was a stockbroker or registered investment advisor or investment advisor representative, you know, there's all those abbreviations for basically the same position. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we were sold. I'm sure you you've dealt with people like us, but uh, you know, we we had to sell like high commission mutual funds. And the one thing I didn't like about mutual funds, and my parents owned a lot of these, and you know, uh, before I learned about investing in markets, most of my savings that my parents had like accumulated for me before I became an adult was invested, you know, in mutual funds, but the mutual funds were, uh, there, there's a lot of risk with these things. There's, you know, much higher fees than exchange traded funds. So the, the exchange traded funds are offering different types of diversification and lower fees. And also, you know, there's, there's management risk of these mutual funds. You have a fund manager, right? And he could just like, um, you know, there's, there's the fund manager like Bill Miller of uh, like Mason, and I think for 15 years in a row, he beat, he beat all the averages, you know, the market averages, benchmarks, all these things, which is unheard of, but most, fan, uh, most fund managers, excuse me, don't beat their benchmarks or averages, and they still collect high fees. And you could have a case, you know, where the fund manager is just really, really bad, and, you know, obviously it's not always the case like this, but you could, and you could have been steered into this because the broker got high commissions and, you know, the fund could drastically underperform all their benchmarks and you could lose a lot of money then. Yeah, I think that's a great point that you bring up. And, you know, part of the, the benefits, I think, of ETFs are that they are such a transparent investment vehicle. So you, know, you could log on to our, our company's website every single day and you could see what all the holdings were that each of our funds held as of the close of the previous night. And you know, it, like, like you said, a mutual fund, if you want to buy a mutual fund or you want to sell a mutual fund, no matter what time you place that call in, 
um, you know, during the trading day, you'll get the closing four o'clock price or roughly that price. With ETFs, you can buy and sell in the same trading day throughout the trading day. So you also have this intraday liquidity. So I think, you know, kind of what ETFs, um, you know, when, when they were first constructed, what they seek to do was create, you know, take the good aspects of a mutual fund and, and try to make them, you know, m maybe even better. And so they took the, you know, the positive things about the mutual funds and incorporated that into the ETF. And they took some of the negative things and said, all right, let's get rid of this and do it this way. And I think, um, you know, you know f just from my time in the industry, I've seen ETFs go from, you know, less than um, globally a trillion dollars um, under management, and now we're you know near the three trillion dollar mark globally. So it's incredible to you know to to have been a part of watching the you know rapid and immense growth of popularity, understanding, acceptance, and awareness of this growing um, product, which is known which are known as ETFs. Yeah, I think they bring a lot of efficiency to the marketplace. And from my perspective, if I'm investing or trading. I always tell people, you know, if you don't have the, if you can't read financial statements, uh, you shouldn't, uh, or you're not paying for a good paid newsletter for someone who can, you probably shouldn't buy individual stocks. You should buy exchange traded funds to give yourself some diversification to an industry or sector or something like that instead. But ETFs also provide people the ability to hedge. So you could have your long positions and then you could buy either married put or a, a put on the ETF and you have a hedged long position then, so you have some insurance. So I think this is giving the investor more options, whereas in the past, like you said, with the mutual fund, it was long only. So if you didn't have a lot of downside protection there and these uh, mutual funds are not super liquid uh, for the for the most part, you know, the mutual fund is always having to figure out, you know, what assets they have to sell. Uh, if they don't have a lot of cash available in the mutual fund, then they have to figure out which shares of stock they're going to dump. And then, you know, that depresses the, the stock price of uh, that uh was a majority shareholder for the mutual fund. I, I think I think kind of another neat thing, which I actually haven't heard people uh, mention before, so maybe this is the first. Who knows? Uh, you know, I, th I think one way to track you know that the the acceptance and how successful ETFs have become. Um, you know, there there aren't any ETFs I've ever heard of that own any shares of mutual funds. However, there are many mutual funds out there now that actually hold shares of ETFs. So I think, wow, I did not know that. Uh -huh. I did not know mutual funds actually buy ETFs. I thought they mostly only buy individual stocks. They, they, mo they mostly do, but they've found it to also be, you know, exactly what ETFs, uh, you know, w went out to become, you know, a, a low cost way to get exposure to asset classes that aren't traditionally easy to get exposure to. It's very, very interesting. Something uh, for additional for our listeners to think about. Now, not not every ETF succeeds, Andrew. Your ETFs have have succeeded, uh, at least a few of them. Now, I was uh, the last time I interviewed you, uh, we were talking about the gold and silver market and your silver junior miners ETF, but you also launched a diamond miners one and uranium miners one as the commodities were in a bear market. Why do you think your ETFs have succeeded where others, uh, there's like lots of failures ETFs as well? Sure. So, so just a quick correction. Uh, we, we didn't have a, a uranium uh, ETF. We had a mining services and equipment ETF, but but you, you, you are correct. We did have to shut down our diamond fund and the mining service fund. And you know, we, we launched it into uh, a difficult market for uh, commodities in the natural resource space. And you know, timing does play a, a major part with with uh, with ETFs as well as you know any type of product that someone wants to launch, whether it's financial or consumer or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, if if, if the timing isn't uh, in your favor, you can face headwinds that could be so difficult. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the the things that I'd been fortunate for was that. Although we did have to wind down two of the funds, you know, we, we I think we did it very um, intelligently. I, we, you know, we wanted to make sure that, of course, we did you know as 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 good of a job of returning um, uh, you know capital to the shareholders because you know the last thing you want to do is is wind down a fund and if you're not giving back as you know as much as you can to the shareholders they're never going to trust you again so you know that was something that was you know of of absolute uh, necessity and importance to us that you know although we had to admit failure with two of our funds we still believed in the concept of being uh, of bring first to market ideas that weren't out there yet that investors wanted and sometimes you know you, you may be too early 
And and however, you know, if you if you stick with with I think that that goal of you know being there to provide investors with in, with uh, you know exposure to investments that they want that aren't there, I think when you do have those ideas that they're ready for at the right time, you you have the ability to be rewarded. And you know, not everyone um, you know has a strategy similar where you know we were you know we were conservative with how how um, you know I chose to spend. Our, our money and marketing dollars and, and, you know, all the little things that you have to think about when running an entire operation. Um, but because of that, it allowed us to stay in the game longer. And when we saw an opportunity to launch the world's first cybersecurity ETF, you know, we, we had everything that we needed in order to, to make it a success. And fortunately, you know, that time around, we had the timing as well. Yeah, and if I could add something too, I mean, you're definitely an entrepreneur and a pioneer and innovator in the ETF space, and I, I think I'm an entrepreneur and a pioneer in the educational technology. What we want to do with Wall Street for Main Street, Certainly. if we can get the, if we can get the funding. But I mean, from a, from my perspective, I know this firsthand. I'm sure you do too. If if as an entrepreneur, if if you're not if you're not failing, you're not trying. So <laughs> it's it's how you you know deal with adversity and overcome it and try to keep a you know realistic attitude that's uh, at least positive most of the time. But um you know I want to get into your your dealings with entrepreneurship now because for our listeners out there I'm going to attach a link to this great piece. Bloomberg did an article on you, a full length one in August of 2015. Our listeners could read the article after this interview comes out. It'll be in the it'll be in the information section. But you know, you you lived on a shoestring budget, and you had you knew you had a good idea, and you know you tried things that may have may have worked out, may have failed, and you know you just kept plugging. Uh, were there moments there where you thought about quitting, where you had burnout, you were working too hard? Uh, how did you overcome these things? You know, I, I think you know the, the burnout aspect was never uh, was never something that I was faced with. You know, it was. It was building, you know, you know, my, my own company, one where, you know, I had a lot of people rooting for me and, you know, I, I didn't want to let anyone down, especially, you know, friends, family and, and shareholders of our of our funds. And, um, you know, I, I was able to um, fortunately enough partner with some some great uh, industry leaders, um, just want, you know, for example, one of them, the International Securities Exchange. And, you know, I found pleasure in, you know, trying to trying to give it my all and it didn't necessarily, you know, work every day. You know, you can make, you know, uh, when you just have one fund, so, you know, a very specific fund like a junior silver fund and you spend all day, you know, making phone calls and trying to get people interested in the investment and, you know, you don't see those inflows, it can be discouraging. But, you know, that, that's part of the challenge of, of you know, exchange traded funds and any type of uh, job where you're creating some type of product and you need to go out there and educate the market and 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 motivate them to be interested as well. Um, you know, it, it, you mentioned the article. I think you know, a, lot, a lot of press that we've gotten recently make it seem like a, a lot of uh, things, you know, that that, you know, we were kind of an overnight success. But, you know, it was it was, you know, a four year overnight success. Uh, and maybe even longer, um, but but I feel the same way too. <laughs> ex exactly, and and you know it's there really is just so much that goes on to to trying to get you know a product off the ground. I mean, we started you know each of our funds with just one hundred thousand shares outstanding, and you know we've grown uh, our, our cybersecurity fund to over forty million shares outstanding, and to have done that in less than one year. Um, to, to to raise a fund from you know 2.5 million dollars to to well north of of a billion dollars, you know it, it isn't the it isn't the industry norm, especially being a, a smaller you know non non previously existing asset management company. But I think it goes to show that you know if, if you if you if you do have you know um, you know a good idea, the right timing. Um, you know, a lot of conviction that even you know it, when it doesn't work at at first to to keep on trying, um, and to do right by your by your investors, and to be transparent and you know and and fortunately for our case, like I mentioned, you know aligning ourselves with some industry leading partners that you know I have all the faith and trust in in the world, um, you know it's it's it really does make it just such a even a more rewarding experience when when things do work out. Yeah, you're starting to have some some great success, but uh, were you were you told that the cybersecurity ETF a lot up front wasn't going to work by like the mainstream Wall Street players, the larger guys that that you were trying to get uh, exposure to the ETF or help you market it and things like that? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, 
you know, being kind of like a, a smaller company, we were kind of viewed as an underdog, at least before, and a lot of people wanted to see us succeed. And when we finally launched that fund that appealed to so many different investors, um, you know, I, I think that they, they were they were happy to, to invest in the fund. And, you know, th there were certainly some skeptics. I know that, um, you know, some uh, ISE had, you know, proposed the idea before to, you know, to people that had you know, thought thought that they were out of their minds coming up with a cybersecurity index, and you know, it it turned out that you know we we happened to to hit you know on the right topic, and sure enough, like we mentioned, timing you know two uh two about two weeks after we launched our fund, the Sony cyber cyber attack happened, and then a couple months later the Anthem breach happened, and you know cybersecurity just became you know front page news on almost a daily occasion, and not only that. But because it became such a, a front page thing, you know, every boardroom was confronted with the fact that, you know, not only, um, you, know, you know, before they could say, okay, I don't want to invest in cybersecurity because it's not going to help our bottom line, it completely changed to saying we don't, we can't risk being breached, um, you know, losing our intellectual property, um, losing our, our credibility in in the marketplace. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, damning emails being leaked into into the public domain, and you know, it became something that they didn't want to spend on because it couldn't make them any any money. To being something that they were forced to spend on because no one wanted to um, could afford, you know, being breached or the, the risk of not being protected. And because of that, there has been such a, a massive increase in spending on cybersecurity solutions that you know. You know, especially when when dealing with financial companies, it's something that gets brought up to them at least monthly at meetings. Um, you know, teaching them to be aware. So then now, when you have this product that you know focuses on the companies that are benefiting from increased cyber attacks and spending on cybersecurity, it just makes so much sense to them. Yeah, it's it's really something like you said. The the companies aren't going to make money on the bottom line off cybersecurity, but if they don't do it, they could lose intellectual property. I hadn't thought about that one as much. What I was thinking though was that you know what you're going to upset your customers, and without customers, there is no business. So <laughs> so if you really upset your customers, like I thought uh, Target, you know, with their data breach a while ago, uh, about a year and a half ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I thought them offering discount coupons and not fixing the problem quickly. I didn't think that was the right the right method there. Uh, you know, I I am a Target customer. I thought it was would have been smarter for them to fix the problem. I don't want a 10 percent off coupon <laughs> for them screwing up and losing my data. I want them to fix the problem to make sure that you know uh, I, I don't start seeing crazy credit card charges and things like that. Exactly, and, and you know, there, there's there's just so much confusion when a company is breached. It's not only okay what what happened. But it's okay now. How do we go forward to to block out that problem that occurred? How do we then go forward to make sure that that problem doesn't happen again? And where else are we vulnerable? And trying to get ahead of it so that you know no type of breach can occur. And unfortunately, there's no solution. There's all there are, there are always going to be um, individuals or groups motivated um, either by profit or you know by uh, hacktivism. Or you know other reasons that 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 make it um, you know appealing to to try to find ways around companies' security um, parameters, which which makes it you know that that just that um, constantly important for companies to keep on top of what they're doing to make sure that they're that they and their comp their uh, their clients customers aren't vulnerable. Exactly, and I think we're gonna have that means I think we're gonna see a bull market for a very very long time. Uh, in spending for cybersecurity. So that's good then for your ETF. Although, you know, the valuations on these companies aren't value investing bargains, but I mean, the, they are clearly in a bull market because there is a fundamental need for companies that are underinvested in uh, protecting their data. The, 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 there certainly is a, um, a growth uh, orientation to many of these companies, as you mentioned. And that's actually, you know, one of the reasons that we thought launching an ETF that focused on a volatile industry like cybersecurity, that, that it made launching an ETF that much more important because so many people want to invest in this industry. And say you pick one, two, three companies that you think are, you know, just absolutely fantastic, and now you have cybersecurity exposure. Well, you now have a ton of company risk as well. And when you pick, you know, just one, two, three companies, the amount of volatility in 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 a in an industry like this can be, you know, significant. So by being able to get exposure, like we said, you know, instant diversification for for hack or cybersecurity fund, 
It's over 30 companies from around the globe that specialize in different areas within the cybersecurity industry. So you really do get um, you know, a broad, pretty pure play exposure to that industry without having to try to pick the, the best one, two, or three companies out there. I just want to compliment you on making a great pivot and adapting to, you know, adding technology ETFs because, you know, it, I thought it was when I had you on last, it was a good idea for the junior silver miners ETF, but the market, uh, you know, there was a lot of weak hands in gold and silver and the prices were going down and people just didn't see, see the uh, things the way you and me saw them. And, you know, you kept that product around, but you said, you know what, I have to make more money off something else. And you switched to technology, which is something that a lot of people find uh, mainstream people, at least, you know, you and me are gold and silver bugs. We like gold and silver. We've talked off air, but most people, most regular people find technology a lot easier to invest in and people are more optimistic about technology. Right. You know, I think they, they appeal to different, um, different types of investors. Um, when, when you are an asset management company, you want to be, you know, you'll, you'll never be, you know, everything to everyone, but you want to have those types of products that through different market conditions, um, you know, that, that products and uh, our funds will behave in, in different manners. So you know, I think it was almost an essential uh, pivot, as you, as you called it. And, you know, ho hopefully, you know, e you know, each funds will have their, their, you know, their own times to, to shine in different environments. Um, and, and, you know, we still are, you know, enthusiastic uh, to have our, our, our junior silver fund out there. I think there are, you know, many, many um, things that we're seeing in the broader global economy that, that make it very interesting. And sure, we've seen precious metals prices sell off pretty significantly, but we've also seen an, in, uh, uh, an interesting bounce in SILJ and whether that's, you know, because people are becoming bullish on precious metals again. Um, if the if the trend is changing, if it was just oversold so much, you know, I'm not I'm not a market timer, but you know, we have seen a pretty vicious bear market in the precious metal space, and you know, junior silver companies are are you know some of the the more volatile but you know higher beta companies out there. So if we were in you know a turning period for precious metals. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't um, you know be far fetched to think that the junior silver miners, which have been punished so much, could uh, turn relatively quickly when when uh, investors are ready to come back to the space. Yeah, and and to add to your argument there, I think from a valuation perspective, the junior silver miners are some of the cheapest valuations available on the market. I mean, gold, silver, oil, these things are dirt cheap right now. People just don't want them. I guess hedge funds saw the China collapsing. Uh, they believe China was collapsing, so they shorted almost every single commodity. Gold and silver have been in a bear market for four years. Uh, oil's been in a bust for 12 months, and we're starting to see the other base metal commodities finally be in a major bust too. So it's uh, commodities are very, very unloved at this point, but we are starting to see the last couple weeks at least, you know, days, even when the gold and silver price, the sp paper spot price doesn't rise, the mining shares are up. So what that says to me at least is that uh, larger money managers are starting to sell out of, st of profitable stock positions or cash they had on the sideline and start to accumulate positions then in the gold and silver miners, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting because it, for some reason, precious metals are such um, you, know, you get such polarized opinions on them. And you have some people that are perma bulls. You have some people that are perma bears. Um, but, you know, it, just like just like equities, just like, you know, currencies, just like other commodities, it's, it's an asset class. And if you're, you know, an advisor or an individual investor, you know, I think one thing that everyone agrees on is having a diversified balanced portfolio. And I, I personally think that, you know, in that in that balanced portfolio, there is a place for precious metals. Um, and, you know, the, the miners and explorers of those metals could be, a, you know, a portion of that precious metals exposure. But if you are someone that truly does believe in, you know, uh, you know model diversified portfolio and, and having, you know, those various exposures, you know, just because the prices are down, if anything, that should mean that people should be, you know, starting to slowly, you know, take on a larger, um, you know, a, lar a larger exposure to those areas. And like you said, you know, this this could be, a, you know, a kind of deep uh, deep value discount kind of um, environment right now, especially in these the 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 beat up junior um, explorers and and you know, you know we could talk about it a little bit more. You know, I know you talk about precious metals a good amount on the show, um, but you know, silver is not only a precious metal, but it has these incredible industrial qualities that make it such a, an, an amazing element. And so, you know, you look at silver and you say, okay, well, 
I, I know that you know it can be stored in, in vaults and coin and bar form or turned into jewelry just like gold, but at the same time, it's also the best conductor of heat of all metals, the best conductor of electricity of all metals, it has antimicrobial, antibacterial properties to it, so it's you know, critical in, in surgical devices, and you know, there, there are so many uses that, that there are for silver right now. Um, you know, some of the more well-known ones being, you know, solar panels. It's in, you know, most switches. It's in computers, cell phones. So, you know, it, in, in a bull market for, you know, um, the creation of industrial goods, you know, silver could do well in a, in a you know, scary monetary, you know, fiasco environment where people, you know, are rushing to precious metals. It also has, you know, those properties as well. So it's a really interesting metal, one that I don't think gets gets a lot of love or attention. Um, but, you know, we saw when, when people did have a focus on it back, you know, in the, the run up up until, you know, early 2011, you know, that when there was demand, you know, the, the, the metal itself can move relatively quickly. Yeah, and silver is also selling below production cost of many of the miners, so that's not sustainable. We've seen the miners the last since 2011, the, mi the primary silver miners, primary gold miners, they've just been behind the cost cutting curve. Every time the paper price drops, you know they're they're always chasing it. I use the analogy on my podcast. It's like Wiley e. Coyote chasing <laughs> the Roadrunner. <laughs> yep. So they never actually catch the Roadrunner, which is the you know paper price, and. It, it's it's just amazing. I look at the uh, uh, financial statements of some of these primary silver miners right now, the producers. I'm sure the juniors are in even worse shape, some of them at least, the ones who don't have cash and aren't producing at a profit right now. But a lot of these primary silver miners, you know, they, they, they run these uh, investor presentations and, and it says, we're not going to generate any free cash flow until silver's at 17 again. And then, you know, one of them says they're all in sustaining costs are at $14.50. And I look and they have seven primary silver mines and three of them are running at big losses. So I guess just the averages, they have a couple, uh, four of them way below 17, uh, below, excuse me, 14.50. But they also have three of them, you know, above 15, way above 15. So it's crazy. Right. I, mean, I, I don't think this is sustainable. I mean, would, you, would you rather right now be, you know, the biggest producer of silver, but doing it at a loss and depleting your reserves and spending money to do so? Or would you rather be, you know, an exploration company that is potentially sitting on some, you know, significant deposits that has some cash and, you know, is, is waiting to, to put something into production until either they get approval or the prices, you know, rebound to, to where they can do it profitably. You know, I, I think that, that the juniors could potentially be in a really interesting situation where the, the mid-tier and the senior producers need to bring more more metal online, and one of the quicker ways for them to possibly do so may be to, to look at acquisitions and, you know, who has, who has silver at a, you know, at a fairly discounted price, and that's probably a lot of the junior, uh, the junior explorers right now. So, you know, I think it's a really interesting time for them. And I think it's it's good to see that there has been some interest coming back, although you know slower than I would have expected. You know that's how that's how trends change. It starts slowly at first and then quickly. Yeah, it's it's like what Sir John Templeton said: bull markets are built on pessimism, <laughs> <laughs> rise on skepticism. Yeah. Uh huh. I forgot the other. I forgot the other. T I, the, the last one is die on euphoria. I forgot the. I forgot the uh, m the middle one. There's a third one. But yeah, I think the silver miners, we are starting to see some mergers and acquisitions. We saw first Majestic Silver buy Silvercrest. Silvercrest was one of the few uh, junior silver miners that was actually making money at a low cost uh, all the way down. So they have been they were doing a good job, and they got scooped up, and we're seeing some potential other. Uh, the presentations I'm seeing from some of the larger guys, they are interested in replacing reserves. The problem with the larger miners, uh, Andrew, is that you know they either hedged at a higher silver price or they took out debt. And when you take out a lot of debt, you kind of don't have choice to um, to cut back on your production or shut a mine exactly. because you have to keep the cash flow going to pay off the debt. Exactly, which is a preca precarious situation to be in. Well, it, it's not a sustainable situation, and yet, you know, we've been down four years. <laughs> it's been a really painful four years. I, I kept buying uh, at points I thought were dips. So, I mean, uh, eventually I think I'll be right. Because uh, when I look at the global financial uh, system and the global economy, I just see like all these governments trying to solve a debt problem with more debt and printing more money and trying to prop up asset prices and prop up their governments and things like that that are drastically over indebted and things. So uh, this is not going to end well. And I think, you know, this 
this is eventually going to lead to much worse inflation down the road or defaults or currency crises or things like that? Yeah, you know, it's it, it, it's it's difficult to to predict when and, and to what extent things will happen in the future. And you know, th- th- this is kind of the reason we're building out this, you know, what we think is a well-rounded um, suite of of, uh, of ETFs to offer the environment. You know, they're they're all, you know, s- some of them kind of play on some of my fears as well. You know, you know, it, it, massive inflation would probably benefit silver uh, and precious metals. So we do have you know a junior silver fund. Um, you know, cybersecurity is, you know, the topic du jour right now. And, you know, there are serious effects, whether it's, um, you know, reputational, uh, physical, you know, potentially catastrophic damages that could occur. You know, and, you know, we have this fund. Um, you know, another fund that we have, which we haven't spoken about yet, is is a mobile payments fund. And, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the movement to a cashless society. Um, you know, is a cashless society, um, you know, a society that I want to live in? Probably not, but the, the fact of the matter is there are many governments around the world, Denmark and Bangladesh, you know, just for example, that are trying to move towards a cashless society. And you, know, you look at you know, different countries in Europe, uh, France, Spain, Italy, and they've all imposed you know, uh, maximum uh, euro cash transactions. So if, you want, if, you, if you're in any of those countries, if you want to purchase something that's you know, over those limits, I believe you know, some of, in some of those countries it's 1,000 euros, others 2,500 euros. Um, you know, if you want to, you know, purchase something, you have to do it, um, you know, not through, through a non-cash uh, transaction. And you know, I, I think each of these kind of things, especially when you look at these futuristic, uh, you know, technology themes that people are, are are looking at, you know, you do have those kind of, um, you know, potential, um, you know, pluses and minuses of how how society can change and adapt. But you know, I think it's 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 really interesting to get exposure to those areas that um, are kind of driving the the direction that we're seeing many uh, policies move. Yeah, and to add to your points there about cybersecurity, you know, with the Ashley Madison hack, you know, there were three. I think there was three suicides uh, based on you know the informa- the personal information that was released, and there's lots of uh, class action lawsuits over people, you know, with ruined marriages that are going to lead to divorce and painful settlements and things like that. So there's a lot of ramifications for people's data getting out that they don't want to get out uh, with these types of websites. And, uh, you know, we see in the Sony situation where it was, I guess, a disgruntled employee, but we saw early on, uh, you know, the mainstream media and governments claiming, oh, you know, it was it was North Korea doing it and things like that. So it's it, it's crazy that we have, you know, governments, whether it's China, Russia or the United States, all trying to hack each other or each other's major corporations or spying on each other with hacking and things like that. Uh, it's, it's it's an amazing world we live in now. It's changed so rapidly in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, people being able to just pay on their cell phones, on their smartphones uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to think about it. But, yeah, the, the cashless society does does scare me a lot as a libertarian. But I see a lot of also, you know, technology savvy people in Silicon Valley who are baby boomers and also millennials, Andrew, who grew up with the Internet. And, you know, they see like, oh, I don't want to carry around a wallet. Oh, I don't use cash. I'll just use my smartphone. So that's like the other side of the coin. But these people don't understand, you know, the negative consequences of this how like all their transactions are being monitored. And, you know, if the government tracks all your transactions, you're spending and sees that they don't line up to your income, you know, they can figure out you're cheating on your taxes very quickly. So uh, it's just, it's pretty crazy that, you know, I try to bring this up to some people about the dangers of a cashless society and they don't see any of these things yet. Yeah, I, it, but at the same time, you know, I think there are many benefits to to the mobile digital electronic payment transaction, um, you know, technologies that are out there. So, you know, I, I think, you know, just like anything, you know, there are good actors and bad actors in any type of, you know, I- environment. Um, you know, what what are the benefits then, however, you know, of mobile electronic digital payments? And, you know, what, what you have is you have, you know, faster transactions, lower fees, lower barriers and ease of use. And those are, you know, real solutions to, to, to real problems that, you know, make this such, um, you know, a growing part of the overall uh, uh, transaction and payment industry. So you, know, you, you think of, you know, emerging frontier markets and you think, okay, well, you know, they're, they're so far behind us. But when it comes to actual, you know, payments and transactions, they're actually leading the, the way. If you look at Kenya, 86% of households are using mobile payments um, for consumer transactions. So, you know, because 
Um, you know, it, it can be so expense, expensive and take so much time to actually build, you know, the traditional infrastructure for payments and transactions. Now, so many people have smartphones and that bypasses the huge time lead that you need to put these things into place, the huge uh, cash expenditures that you need to put out to build up, you know, a traditional infrastructure for, for um, you know, payments and transactions. And you're seeing them leading the way, and they're they're they've adapted to it so quickly because it f it fills all those needs of the ease of use, the the speed of transaction delivery, and the and the lower fees. And so you know there are some some real um, tangible benefits that we're seeing, and it's and that that's why this is you know every single year for you know in, in over the last decade we've been seeing mobile payments becoming a larger slice, a larger wedge in that overall payments and transaction pie. Yeah, we've seen PayPal explode in size. Uh, you know, it was one of the main parts of eBay's core business. I guess they just spun it out after Carl Icahn, I think, arranged to do that. And the Kenya uh, payment system, I think, is M-Pesa. But, uh, you know, we're starting to see innovation in uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And perhaps then in your future uh, mobile payments ETF, we'll see some cryptocurrency companies and Bitcoin-related companies in the future as those start to go public in the next uh, five to ten years. Right, and, and so you, like you said, you know, we, we currently don't have the the cryptocurrency companies uh, in the fund. But one of the things I was so excited about when when seeing the final index from the International Securities Exchange, the company that's built uh, all the indexes actually so far for each of our ETFs, was that you know it has the intelligence built into the index that as liquid publicly traded companies that are in the the digital crypto space um you know come to market and become these liquid uh investments that 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 is something that actually can be included into the index and then um, later on the fund so you know i think they did a really good job looking at the current landscape and where the future landscape may go and allowing it to be um you know creative and um you know innovative adaptive enough um, to to take on you know this this growing industry because you know when you look at technology you know you have an idea of you know kind of where the different parts and pieces are are moving towards but what that final picture will look like you don't know so I think it's you know great working with a partner like International Securities Exchange that you know that that takes that into consideration doesn't just look at the now you know when we're looking at technology you're really looking at the future and we wanted to kind of carve up the the interesting growth areas that investors want that exposure. To of these truly global industries that are in, in their fairly early stages and getting that diversified exposure to you know the different companies specializing and create new innovative technology um, to, to really try to figure out um, you know which technology is going to win because it's, it's tough to do that right now to figure out you know what that te winning technology will be you know 10 20 years from now which I think is you know brings us back to you know one of the advantages of being able to invest in an ETF because you get that diversified exposure to many companies as opposed to trying to pick that one that's going to win yeah and the symbol for your mobile payments ETF that's IPay exactly IPAY and you also have another new ETF that's the big data ETF that's BDAT. Exactly. This is the world's first big data and analytics ETF. And kind of, you know, what we've mentioned with our other themes, it's we think that we can provide the market the most benefit by creating first to market ETFs that don't exist. And, you know, big data may to some seem like one of those nebulous topics. You know, what is big data? Oh, well, you know, my, I saw the movie Minority Report or, or what have you. Um, you know, IBM Watson, uh, you know, saw, saw that, uh, you know, that, that being able to, to, to win Jeopardy. Um, but it, it's so much more. And, you know, what, what is big data? Well, big data is, to us, it's the three Vs. It's volume, velocity, and variety. And so it's essentially these very different uh, high, high quantity, high speed, um, new data points that are being created every single millisecond whether it's your Internet of Things device sending something, some signal back, um, whether it's, you know, your fantasy sports team, you know, piling up stats, whether it's, um, you know, medical records going uh, uh, digitized, you know, it's all these different data points from, from everywhere. And, you know, once you are able to, you know, take, take information and turn that into, you know, something digital so it could be stored whether it's in the form of a video or a picture or a text or a zero and a one um, you know the more information you have the more connections uh, the more dots that you have the more connections that you can find 
And, you know, this is one of these, you know, major, major things that we're learning that, you know, we, we have an idea of things that we want to, um, you know, create with all this data. But the things that are being created that we didn't necessarily expect, you know, the original intent to be have become, you know, just as, you know, immensely valuable. So, you know, just, just looking at one, one company in the fund, uh, Facebook. Well, okay, Facebook, a lot of people say that's a social media company. Well, actually, it's a big data company. It is, you know, the largest, especially with this acquisition of Instagram, it's the largest database in the world of photographs. And what were they able to do with that? They were able to develop the one of the greatest facial recognition softwares in the world. Well, I mean, that kind of scares me a little bit, facial recognition technology, but there's value to them creating this. Now, they can use it. They can help you know, advertisers identify things with this. They could license out the software to defense companies and, and other companies that, that could use that. So you know, they didn't necessarily set out saying, okay, um, you know, uh, I'm Mark Zuckerberg. Day one, I want to create facial recognition software. You know, he said, I wanted to create a platform. And on this platform, you know, all of a sudden, all this data became originated and aggregated. And now they're able to use this to, you know, to, to find and create these amazing new technologies. Um, you know, Google tracking the spread of diseases from people using the search engine. You know, I, I, I think it's a really interesting area that we have no idea what will be created from it, but the companies that have the data, where the data is being created, where it's being aggregated, and then on the other side of the of the coin, the companies that are actually able to extract this data, help you visualize it, and help companies make better decisions, allocate their resources better, and better serve their clients. And that's what we've been able to compile into this idea that we know investors are looking for but you know, how do you define big data? I think ISC yet again did another wonderful job taking that theme and turning it into an investable product that I think individuals that want to invest in the big data revolution now have a vehicle to do so. Yeah, I think I think cybersecurity, I think mobile payments, and I think big data are all in bull markets. You definitely have tailwinds there. It's not headwinds. Now, if you want to really be a contrarian, and I brought this area up to you, one of the most unloved technology industries right now is 3D printing. So you'd basically be uh, starting a 3D printing ETF. And the reason I think it would be popular, Andrew, is when I talk to other value, uh, other investors and we're looking for value in the technology markets, uh, there's a lot of these 3D printing companies, whether is 3D Systems or Stratasys. 3D Systems is down a lot. It went from $80 a share a year, a year and a half ago, down to around 12-ish, I think, last time I looked at it. That's an enormous crash, but now it's only selling at two times revenue. So you have all these patents and IP technology. People kind of want an uh, ability to diversify because they don't know which 3D printing company is going to be the winner. So, uh, you know, from a contrarian perspective, I think this would be a very interesting product for you guys to launch here that, you know, I don't know exactly when the bottom of the market's going to be, but I know a good technology company with a lot of patents that's growing, still growing revenues uh, pretty good uh, every couple years that, uh, you know, the, the value of the company, if it's trading at two times revenue and has sale, uh, revenue growth and, and IP, it looks very interesting to me. And there's a number of these companies in 3D printing, you know, the market, the technology investors just don't love the sector right now. But something's cheap, you know, long term, uh, eventually there might be some value could have uh, takeovers of some of these companies in the near future. Yeah. And you know, we, we, you know, as, a, as an ETF company, can't can't discuss, you know, funds that we don't have on, on the market or, or, you know, the kind of the plans there. But, you know, I mean, I, I think that's a great example of, you know, an industry where, um, you know, it's, it's early stages and, you know, the implications of what can be you know, created and how it could change, um, you know, current industries, you know, forever. You know, are are certainly there um, now. Kind of one of the problems that you look at when you look at an industry that's you know as early stages as 3D printing is that you don't necessarily have a lot of large market cap liquid companies to build out you know a full diversified portfolio. So you know may, maybe that is in you know an industry where you can pick you know your five favorite or something like that and build your own kind of own personal mini basket of of, of companies there. But you know, for for an ETF, you know, something that to really has the ability to get scale, you really do want to see you know over 20 at least, um, you know, very liquid companies, so that 
um, you know, you can create that vehicle for investors that, you know, is, is liquid, is diversified, um, you know, and it's, and it's not just very heavily weighted on maybe three companies or so. Okay, so I'll have to tell my friends then who ask me why there's not a 3D printing ETF. They have to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'd love to, to launch, uh, you know, the first uh, time travel ETF, but there's not enough companies yet. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't know there's any that have had success with that in, in the lab yet. Now, I know there, there's rocket companies that are working on, like, twin ion engines and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, – obviously, SpaceX isn't publicly traded, but there's a few rocket companies that are – so maybe that's another idea. These A few of the companies are actually pretty big, but there's not enough of them yet. Sure, yeah, and, you know, we're, we're, always, we're always looking for, you know, new ideas and trying to, you know, keep our finger on the pulse and, and see, you know – uh, and, and at the same time, you know, just because uh, you know, there's there's something that's hot right now, we're, we're looking for these long term themes too. We don't want to create an ETF that gets you know a lot of buzz and gets you know really you know hyped up for three years, and all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, like that technology, you know, that's that's the disc man. You know, I want the MP3 and the and the iPod. Um, you know, we're we're looking for these you know large growth trends and themes that investors are, are, are looking for ways to get exposure yet. You know, don't necessarily have have the the time or the 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 ability to to build a diversified portfolio. Very good. Uh, in wrapping up the interview, can you please tell listeners where they can uh, research more of your ETFs? Absolutely. Our our website is purefunds.com. That's p u r e f u n d s dot com. Or you could just you know throw in our company name, Google it, and it's uh, you know I'm sure it'll pop up too. And we're actually in the process of rebuilding our website too, so I you know, certainly encourage your your viewers to check back regularly. Whenever we have new funds, we uh, you know we put them up on the website with all the information on there. Um, and you know we're, we're trying to do some new things and do some different things that you know our uh, our other our other colleagues in the space aren't aren't really doing. I think you know kind of playing towards the technology uh, themed investments it, it, it really complements what we're what we're doing uh, fund wise. And you know, please feel free to reach out if you have questions. We have you know contact information on our website, and you're know, happy to get back to you and answer any questions you may have. Very good. And I think you've done a lot since you launched you launched your company in 2010. You know, you hung in there, you built a business. I, I'm very proud to have known you, uh, hearing you get off from the, from the very beginning. Uh, you know, you started with silver, you did a great pivot, um, and I'm excited excited to see uh, you know how things play out with with your future uh, ETFs launch. I think. I think you're definitely onto something with uh, mixing technology and also silver. So we'll have you back on in the future to talk about technology markets and also the silver market. I want to thank you again for your time, though. Uh, th thank you. I look forward to, to joining whenever I can. And, um, yeah, enjoy the weekend.